because you and I talk in live, so okay, I just kind of know that, but it looks like we're about to stream live. Okay, I think we're live on Facebook which is great. So I think uh, Dr. Meyer, what we'll do is kind of give everybody a minute or so to, to hop on. Um, I know these things tend to kind of be last minute for people taking lunch breaks. So I think we'll get going in just a second. Okay. All right, and can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Courtney. You're freezing up a little bit, but I can I can hear you. Okay. You know how these things sometimes the internet gets a little delayed, so we'll just um, we'll just roll on and work through it. Um, but for anybody hopping on, um, my name is Courtney Maddox. I am with Seattle. Okay. Farm Bank, and I am joined here today with um, Dr. Meyer of Carolina Conceptions, as you know. So we are hopping on today to talk all things donor sperm and to um, talk to you a little bit about how the process works from both the clinical side and then working with the sperm bank. And then uh, we're going to open it up. This is going to be very casual. We want you to ask questions to put them in the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring them and uh, we'll have some time at the end of um, the, the casual presentation to answer any questions. So Dr. Meyer, if you wanna kick us off, I'll let you um, talk a little bit about okay. the process and how it works at the clinic. Okay, I sure will. So my name is Bill Meyer. I'm one of the four doctors here at Carolina Conceptions. This is new for me. This is the first time I've done these talks on Facebook, so kind of bear with me here. Um, right now, I can see Courtney. can't see anybody else, but I guess that's the way it goes. I've um, been doing reproductive endocrinology and infertility for about 30 years, and when I first completed my fellowship, um, even during the fellowship, when we, did, uh, when we selected sperm donors, it was all fresh sperm, so we actually had the gentleman come to the clinic and they used to, uh, usually they were on, you know, 24, 48 hour notice and they knew that they had to come in. In fact, um, when I was in Northern Virginia, when I completed, um, there was a doctor who was incarcerated for um, using his own sperm to inseminate several women. So they're now with the banks that have happened over the last 25 to 30 years, the rules and regulations have obviously improved the whole clinical safety of uh, donor insemination. Um, I, a little bit more of my background, I was at one of the universities here, local University of North Carolina, and I was head of their sperm bank there when I was there. Now our um, patients get to choose various banks. Um, obviously, Courtney represents the Seattle Sperm Bank. We have a great relationship with them. We also use any of the other banks, including like California Cryo, Fairfax, and there are other banks that are um, all FDA approved to do that. So who uses donor insemination? And I'll talk for about five minutes or so. The, the, in the past, a lot of patients who use donor insemination were straight couples who the husband had a very low sperm count and it was so poor that they probably were not going to have success even with in vitro fertilization. And then in the mid 1990s or so, intracytoplasmic sperm uh, injection came along, ICSI as you probably know it, and we were able to use low numbers of sperm to um, uh, obtain fertilization, obtain good embryos, and obtain pregnancy. And so ICSI was something that allowed many heterosexual couples or couples who were gonna use a low sperm count in their male partner the opportun opportunity to do so. And, but now what's happened in the last oh, decade or so, the use of donor sperm has once again increased and it's somewhere in the four to 12% neighborhood 
depending on what um, uh, surveys you read. And I think a lot of that is because many um, single women and gay women feel comfortable using sperm banks, which many of them may not have done so much in the future, or were not comfortable just coming out and admitting that they were gonna try to get pregnant on their own. Um, so who do we use donor sperm now in? Well, heterosexual couples who the male is azospermic, meaning he's not producing any sperm at all. And we do need donor sperm in that case. Um, we, use, we obviously use it in single and gay women. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the screening and how we do it at Carolina Conceptions. Um, obviously, so much of this has been virtual over the last year, but we talk to couples. Um, we now have a nurse practitioner, uh, Megan Minton, who I think is listening to this Facebook uh, presentation. And uh, Megan is gonna spend a lot of time with our couples who are interested in uh, obtaining donor sperm in the future. Um, what we do is we obviously go through a history with all our patients and uh, most of them have a pretty good idea. In fact, many of them are, have already gone to the sperm banks and looked at the possibilities of the sperm they can choose. But we, do through the, we go through the um, screening that you would normally expect. And then one of the things we do test for is cytomegalovirus antibodies, and that's called CMV. And we obtain CMV IgM and IgG, and not to get too complicated about it, but that's where we're looking for antibodies to see if women are immune to CMV. If they are CMV negative, and we look at the IgG component of the antibody, if they're negative, then we encourage women to use a CMV negative sperm donor. Now in our practice, um, you can use a CMV positive donor if you're CMV negative, but you have to sign a, uh, a form that uh, notify or makes us aware that you know the risks that are associated with it. Now, what are the risks? Well, um, the theory is that a CMV positive donor, sperm donor, might potentially infect the inner lining of the uterus um, in a uh, CMV um, negative uh, recipient. And as far as I know, there are no um, history or cases of someone getting infected that way. So then it comes into the question, what else do we need to screen uh, sperm donor our uh, recipients for? Well, we actually have uh, uh, heterosexual couples, we have them talk to a psychologist too, because we are bringing in a third party. Um, this is something that can be um, a, a hurdle for some couples to uh, get over when they're thinking about doing donor sperm in the setting of uh, um, a, a heterosexual couple. Um, we Sometimes we obtain anti-mullerian hormone levels on our recipients, AMH levels. Um, and sometimes we do hysterosalpingograms, which are x-rays of their fallopian tubes and their uterus before we decide to do donor insemination. In fact, at our practice, I tend to be a little bit more relaxed about doing that testing. Some of my partners tend to be a little bit more stringent in their criteria where they get HSGs and they do AMHs. Um, so anyway, that's some of the screening we do on uh, patients. Uh, you're, I know Courtney's going to talk a little bit about what's available as, a, as well as in the, in the sense of donor sperm. Um, I'm going to talk about how we do our inseminations, and then I'll let Courtney talk about it. In most cases, um, we will let women choose between using a low medicated cycle. We usually use Famara or Letrozole. And we bring patients in those cases back for a day 12 ultrasound. We look at their follicles. And if they produce an egg or a nice mature follicle, then we trigger them with HCG and do the insemination 36 to 40 hours later. There was a recent report that came out that um, in uh, women who are uh, uh, gay or single women who have not tried to conceive and are going to use donor insemination as compared to husband insemination, that pregnancy rates um, were actually equivalent or just as uh, good using 
um, just ovulation monitoring, where they just monitor their urine. When they have an LH surge, we do the insemination the next day. And this, what was also interesting about this article, in, in contrast to heterosexual couples who use husband or partner insemination, the pregnancy rates stay pretty consistent over six cycles of doing donor insemination. And that's why in our cases, usually in husband insemination, we say after three or four cycles, if you're not pregnant, we usually need to go on to a new modality. That's probably extended in people who are doing donor insemination. That should be extended probably to six months. Now, we are, the last thing uh, that I'll just talk about is um, in gay women who come to our clinic who are going to use donor sperm, we often uh, discuss Invacel with them, which is a um, kind of a dummy down type of in vitro fertilization where you the couple goes through um, stimulation of her ovaries, a much uh, less aggressive stimulation of, of ovaries. And then um, we do an egg harvest and we combine the eggs and the sperm and we actually put them in a very small container. Um, I don't know, you might be able to see this, but it's just a small vial. It's only about two inches in size. And then that's held high in the vagina with a uh, diaphragm like this. And the woman goes home with her eggs and the donor sperm in that little vial and she keeps it um, intravaginally is held in place by the diaphragm. And then she comes back five days later. We remove the diaphragm, the vial, search for embryos, and then we transfer one embryo and freeze the rest. And that's called Invacel. Um, Carolina Conceptions has the highest pregnancy rates around, in, the, in fact, in the United States. We're a leader in doing Invacel. And it can be a nice alternative to doing just donor insemination in patients. Um, we see pregnancy rates as high as 90% with Invacil. Now, when uh, um, women decide to do Invacil, we usually tell them if they're going to go to the banks like Seattle Sperm Bank to actually order unwashed sperm. And I think, Courtney, you can talk in a few minutes about what the difference might be between washed and unwashed sperm. But we notice that the sperm will bind to the eggs much better in when we do Invacil if we do use unwashed sperm. So that's an alternative to doing donor insemination in the clinic. Um, usually the cost of insemination can run anywhere from you know, $1,500 to $2,000 in a cycle. Invacil can cost six to $8,000. Um, so that, I, I, I think it's a nice alternative to, um, to doing the standard donor insemination. So that's a little of an overview of, of what we do at Carolina Conceptions. We have a very active program. It's probably gonna become more active as we have our nurse practitioner devote um, a lot of her time to seeing these patients. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Courtney. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Um, and again, if you're just hopping on, my name is Courtney Maddox. I am from Seattle Sperm Bank. I am one of the clinic relations managers, which means I get to hang out with uh, cool physicians like Dr. Meyer and, and make sure that clinics are supported. Um, I'm actually located in Charlotte, North Carolina, so not far from Raleigh. Um, but Seattle Sperm Bank has been around for over 14 years. We've helped create over 10,000 families around the globe, so we have tons of experience um, in the industry. We have three lab locations. So we have um, our main lab is in Seattle, Washington. Um, we also have two other labs that we recruit donors, one in San Diego, California, and then another in Phoenix, Arizona. But if you're chiming in from um, somewhere outside of the Raleigh market, we work with clinics all across the country um, to help, like Dr. Meyer said, LGBTQ families, uh, single women by choice, and then of course, um, those heterosexual couples that are having male factor infertility. Um, our staff runs the gamut of our own family building journeys. We have... Um, people on our staff that have done IVF and um, same-sex couples that are family building as well. So we are here to handhold your hand through the process. We, we know how it works. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, why use a sperm bank and what you can expect when, um, when coming to the bank. We understand this process is expensive. Dr. Meyer just talked about the cost on the clinical side. And certainly there is an investment on purchasing uh, donor sperm vials. 
Um, but and it may be tempting to look for alternative sources on something like Facebook uh, that are free, but kind of let me break down what goes into the cost of a vial um, so that you understand sort of how it works on our end. Um, you're essentially getting peace of mind that these are healthy, well-vetted individuals. Um, all sperm banks that are licensed here in the United States are regulated by the FDA, um, as well as another organization called CLIA, which is Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. Um, we are required to have tissue bank licenses in certain states um, where that's mandated. So it really kind of comes down to there are a lot of eyes on us um, at the sperm banks, and this is all well-regulated and a very safe and reliable option for you. Um, the donors are all routinely tested for infectious diseases um, so that you are never getting a sample that hasn't been quarantined for a minimum of six months. And those donors are retested before that vial is actually released to be sold. Um, we're also going to reduce chances of passing on any genetic conditions. Um, I think Dr. Meyer talked a, a little bit about that, but we run extensive genetic testing on all of our donors and have our own in-house licensed genetic counselor who reviews the donor's um, full family medical history to look for any additional risk factors that may be popping up there. Um, we also do background checks on all of the donors, um, record verification. So if a guy says that he's in med school or graduated from with an engineering degree from a specific college, we're checking that out very early on in the process. So they are who they say they are. Um, and then you also know that you're working with effective samples. So how it works is with every donation that a donor makes, we do a full semen analysis. So that's really ensuring that you're getting a high quality vial um, with every purchase and um, giving you the best chances to have pregnancy. Um, we're also going to handle all the legal documentation to remove parental rights from the donor side so that both parties are protected there. Um, so we often get asked, you know, where do I start? Maybe I've already met with Dr. Meyer. He has, you know, said, okay, let's get going. You need your donor sperm here in a couple weeks, whatever that is. Um, how does it work on our end? We want to um, kind of help you set up some framework on the type of donor that you're looking for. Really kind of make a list on what's important to you, what values um, that you have in a donor, what are you willing to be a little bit flexible on? You know, we may want someone that's six foot, but can we settle for a guy that's five ten? Um, ethnicity tends to be obviously a non-negotiable in a lot of um, a lot of families. You know, maybe you want them to look like your family members, or you have a partner who is of a different ethnicity. So um, that's important to you. Do you want your donor to be athletic? Um, or education details important to you? Uh, really make that list and, and kind of get those parameters going. And then when you're ready to start, um, you're purchasing what we call as an all access pass. So this is a $50 three months unlimited pass. It gives you access to all of our 200 plus donors um, in the catalog. So with that, you're going to get all the fun stuff, um, the baby photos uh, that come with each donor. You're going to get an audio interview, which is really, really fantastic. We sit down with all of the guys and um, talk to them about their uh, you know, travel history, what was their relationship like with their parents, um, what are their career goals, things like that that would be of interest to you. Um, you get a full family medical history with that all-access pass. You're also getting um, a personality test. You're getting a staff impression. Um, and the donor's also writing a letter to the intended parents, which is really nice too. Um, once you get your all access pass, you're getting access to other free services such as free donor consultations. So that's typically a 30 minute phone call to discuss your priorities and help you narrow down your, your donors into a more manageable list. Um, we also offer free photo matching services. So this is a hand selected service. Um, everyone, of course, has different levels of attractiveness or whatever physical characteristics you're going off of. So you can email in a picture of your partner or a family member um, that you want us to refer or recommend um, donors based on this physical characteristics. Um, and then post baby, you're going to be able to take advantage of um, services like that second parent adoption letters. Um, we're going to ensure that you have proper documentation needed um, for any work that you're doing with a third party attorney. Um, this is commonly requested with same sex couples and we, we do this all the time. We also have a really cool forum that we call um, SSB Connects. So this is our internal sibling registry um, and it's going to allow parents to establish relationship with other donor families. 
Um, everything is completely anonymous, which allows patients to connect with other families based on their own personal comfort level. But that's something that we have um, a ton of people take advantage of, which is really great. Um, so after you purchase your donor, uh, you have the option either to ship immediately to your clinic or to store for future use. So all of the purchases that you have with us come with free storage, some sort of free storage. Um, if you buy two or more vials, you're getting six months free storage, and, and it goes on from there. We offer both two-day and overnight shipping. So, for instance, to Raleigh, um, two-day shipping is $180, um, and then you can tack on an additional $100 for overnight shipment. But something really cool we've established with Carolina Conceptions is um, we have a free shipping offer. So if you purchase three vials and ship them all at once, you're gonna get um, free shipping, which again is a cost saving of $180. And like I mentioned before, if you're storing your uh, three vials, you're gonna get free storage for six months. Then when you're ready to ship, you get free shipping. So for working with their clinic, you get you know, some pretty significant cost savings, which really adds up um, over time. Um, and then we also want you to think ahead. I know it's you know, if you're early on in the process and this is maybe your first attempt to have a baby, it's hard to think about what your complete family picture looks like, but we want to help you do that now to make sure that you're set up for success in the, in the future. So we're going to talk to you about purchasing enough vials for future pregnancies that you can have um, in storage with us until you're ready to, to pursue that second sibling. We do offer discounted storage for anyone that has a birth report with us. Um, to keep those vowels in storage. We do easy vowel transfers between partners. So if you're carrying, you know, on this first pregnancy and you want your partner to carry on the next one, um, we can transfer vowels between every, um, between you both and make that really easy for you. And then we also offer a vowel back by that program. So kind of how that works is that if you purchase six vowels, you get pregnant uh, on the third one, with uh, with Dr. Meyer and you have a couple left and you're like, you know what, we I, our family's complete, we don't need another sibling. Um, we'll buy back those leftover vials at 50% of the original purchase. So um, I know that was a lot of information that I just sort of squeezed into the last few minutes, but please know that our client services team is simply fantastic. We can walk you through any questions that you have. Again, we work very closely with Carolina Conception so we can make that shipping process and getting the vials that you need um, seamlessly over to you. Um, so I think what we're going to do now, Dr. Meyer, is um, maybe open it up for some live questions. You're on mute. Um, you want to take that out? While he's doing that, I've got some questions we posed on Instagram the other day with um, promoting the event, and we got some pretty good questions already, but if you're live with us on Facebook and you want to ask Dr. Meyer something or myself, please pop it in the chat box and I'll be able to, um, to get you there. Let's see, Dr. Meyer, let's see if I can ask you to unmute. Thanks. Hey, Courtney, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you, can you answer this? Can you talk a little bit I, um, about the type of sperm you offer, like unwashed, washed, IVF? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you for um, clarifying that. So we have three types of vials at Seattle Sperm Inc. So we've got, our most common vial is an IUI vial. That means it's washed and ready to go for an IUI insemination. It's removed all the seminal fluid. Um, so it's really easy to get in that catheter and, and ready um, to be presented in the uterus. We also offer an ICI vial, which is um, an unwashed vial. And so that's what Dr. Meyer was talking about for the Invo cell. Um, they are the same price. There is no price difference between the two. Um, the unwashed vial, it just, again, is gonna have that seminal fluid still on there. And those counts are gonna be a little bit higher because if you wash or process the sperm, you're gonna automatically lose a little bit of the count. So those um, are 15 million. Um, total middle sperm and then our ICI wash, our IUI wash files um, have a 10 million um, middle sperm guarantee. We also offer a third type of vial. This one is a little bit less expensive, but they are called art vials and they are specifically designed for um, those ICSI procedures. So if you move on to IVF or ICSI, um, where they are actually creating your embryo in the lab, 
they're going to need much fewer sperm to work with. So those vial counts are about five to nine million on those. Um, and again, those are specifically for those, um, those IVF or ICSI procedures. And we offer those. Our team can walk you through, um, you know, based on the donor that you have, sometimes the inventory fluctuates on the types of vials that are available for that specific donor. So we can have those conversations with you. Um, you know, we're happy to reach out to the lab to, to confirm that you're, you're getting the right vial. But um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Oh, that was great. That was great. And I, you know, I wanted to comment too, you're the, you're the only bank who's actually visited Carolina Conceptions, which is great. And you guys offer super service for our patients and we really do appreciate that. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, you guys are excellent. We, we love everyone on the team. Um, and so it's been a really good partnership for us. So, um, okay, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions at you if it's okay. We. Yeah. we one come in about the CMV status, but I think you clarified that earlier that um, if someone is a CMV patient, they're going to, that you would allow them to also select from a CMV positive donor. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. And do you know the, um, the statistics on what part of the population is actually CMV positive and CMV negative? I, I want to say about 80%. Is it more than that? No, that, I don't have a specific um, statistic, but that sounds about right. I mean, the vast majority of us as adults have been exposed to CMV. Right. Um, so I think it's more common for us to be a CMV um, positive patient than negative, but it does happen. I mean, we frequently get calls from patients that are CMV negative and their, um, their clinic is recommending that they find a CMV negative donor. So we can help them with that. We can certainly help them um, search. Uh, you can do it right on our website but our team can help you navigate that as well. What percentage of your donors are CMV negative compared to CMV positive? Um, it's a very small portion. I will say it's harder to find a CMV negative donor yeah. um, than it is CMV positive. For just the, the reason I stated earlier as adults, you know, the vast majority of us have been exposed, right? And we yeah. never even knew it. This is not something that, um, you know, you're gonna probably go in the hospital for anything. This is a very common, um, virus that presents like a cold, correct? Yeah. Doctor? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and the concern of it is, which, you know, I think, I know you can't really comment on it, but I think it's overblown the concern about the uh, positive and negative. The concern is that women who get a fever during pregnancy, early pregnancy, they do something called their obstetricians will do torch studies on them, the T, the O, the R, the C, and the H, and the C is CMV. So they're always trying to rule out CMV infection in early pregnancies. And that's why it's come into vogue. And that's why, you know, we test and that's why you provide CMV negative donors if, if need be. But like you said earlier, too, we will let our patients sign off on that. So if they're CMV negative and they want to use a CMV positive donor, we're okay with that. Okay. Uh, we got another good question um, from someone that said, would I be required to do genetic screening at the clinic before purchasing donor sperm? No, you're not. In fact, what we usually, since you do genetic screening on the donors, we usually ask them to find out, hey, if there's, you know, if the donor obviously is negative, then there's no need for screening. If the donor is positive for a specific trait, a genetic disease trait, then we can, we can have the recipient actually be tested for that. Okay. It, it's interesting because over the last, you know, five to 10 years, as you know, there's been so much more testing done and become available. And, then, and I guess that brings up a point I should ask you is, you know, one of the things we are concerned about when we see couples is not necessarily undergoing donor insemination, but how much screening should they actually undergo? How, how many traits do you, or how many genetic diseases do you all test for? We screen for 175 conditions. We use a company called Myriad, um, formerly counsel, some, some physicians know it as that. But um, yeah, so we're screening for 175. Now, like you mentioned, um, the panels have gotten bigger as the technology has evolved. So donors that you know joined our program maybe five years ago were, test on a, were screened on a smaller panel. Um, we have a genetic counselor on our staff who, again, can, you know, talk to the patients, be able to help them navigate 
based on if they have been screened or um, if they do have a known condition um, can kind of help navigate these panels. It can be overwhelming, you know, for a patients that see, you know, a condition pop on one of these donors and you've never heard of the word, much less be able to pronounce, know how to pronounce it. Um, so our, our team is there to kind of help handhold you through that process as well. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's it. Let me ask you a question. We, um, we don't get the, a chance to talk that much. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, <laughs> what, as a bank, how do you limit the amount of pregnancies, the number of pregnancies to an area? Are, are, are you required to do that? And how do you do it? Yes, yeah, so ASR, ASRM has guidelines available um, for tissue banks like ourselves. Um, but we limit all of our donors to a 25 family limit, which is well under the ASRM guidelines for that. And so the way it works is that we, when we get a pregnancy report, we obviously um, record that for the specific donor. We do record where the pregnancy comes from so that we know. Um, but in reality, we are shipping not only all over the country, but all over the world. So our, our donors are very uh, naturally well spread out, um, but we do have that family limit so that when we see a donor is getting close to that 25 family number, we're going to actually pull that donor off the website and secure them for sibling only vials. So like I spoke about earlier, um, it's it's very common and very natural for people want that want their children to have um, be biologically connected through their through the same donor. So in order to do that, we need to um, be really diligent and um, methodical about how we distribute the vials that are left, especially if we get down to a donor that maybe has retired or has, um, you know, is moving out of, of town for whatever reason. So he only has so many vials left. Um, and, and the reality is a lot of these donors never make it to that 25 family number just because they're not in the program long enough. So again, we really, um, we, we have records and, and things that we make sure that, uh, you know, there's birth reports that are coming in. That's why it's so important too. I wanted to mention that uh, birth reporting is something that is very important um, to make sure that you're getting in, whether you're working with our bank or another bank, because that is how we are, um, we're able to uh, navigate it and make sure that these donors are staying well within those, those family limits. Yeah. You know, Courtney, another thing that I've read some articles on is, you know, you, obviously you present a lot of information on the donors, their background, their personal characteristics and stuff. And, you know, just for the couples that are out there, this can be agonizing to try to pick the right donor sometimes. And there have been, you know, psychological research papers written on how people do actually agonize over trying to choose the right donor. And um, although I think it's great that you, every bank provides that information, sometimes it can be quite uh, overwhelming. Absolutely. No, it can. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We have some patients that you can see purchase the all access pass. And then in 20 minutes, they found a donor and they are shipping it to their clinic. And then we have other patients that have, you know, selected a pass and used up their full three months and like, I just can't decide, you know, it's between this or, or that one. So we understand everybody approaches it much differently. And um, something that I didn't mention earlier, but I, I do want to go back and emphasize is that Seattle Sperm Bank um, offers open ID donors exclusively. So this means that all of our donors have been counseled and contractually agree to at least one form of contact uh, with any offspring at the age of 18. So this is something that would be initiated by the child um, when they're adult. And we would help facilitate that contact, whether it's through phone call or email or whatever futuristic contact looks like. Um, but it's really kind of putting the, um, you know, putting the ownership back into the, the child or the intended parents to be able to have their, the option to contact the donor if that's important to you. Some families, it's not important to them at all. You know, they, they don't think that, you know, they ever need to just talk to the donor, but some families, maybe they grew up with a single mom and they're just curious about, um, you know, what, what their donor looked like. Did I get my dimples from my donors? Those kind of things. So 
Having an open ID donor, I think, is something to really consider on the front end, because if you get an anonymous donor from a bank, um, you can't go backwards. You're not going to be able to switch in at the age of 18, find out like, oh, I have no way of contacting this person um, because now I'm curious. So um, we can, you know, again, we can kind of talk to, through this during donor consultations and help you um, navigate some of those questions. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this was coming in from, uh, she said, I'm a healthy 28-year-old. Um, on average, how many IUI attempts should I expect to get pregnant? Yeah, I think that's a great question. We tell, we tell couples that they should expect a 60% pregnancy rate at about six months or so. So what I tell them is we're going to start off with the uh, treatment and they can do either, if they're ovulatory, they can monitor their own urine if they're um, concerned about that, which they can be, because like you said, it, 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 it is a costly procedure. Um, we will put them on a low dose medication that will not increase their risks of having twins and it allows us to monitor them more carefully. Then we usually do three cycles. And then after three cycles, if they're not pregnant, then we'll do a little bit more of an uh, extensive evaluation. So. I guess the, the roundabout answer to that is uh, three to six cycles um, you would expect to be pregnant, yeah. Um, here's another one. Uh, how many vials of sperm should I order and what type for IUI, InvoCell, and IVF? Um, I think we kind of addressed some of those earlier. I don't know if you have any additional comments. Yeah, on that. What I, well, what I tell patients is just based on the last question where we kind of expect a decent pregnancy rate after three insemination cycles that three seems to be a good number plus, you know, the relationship with your company allows patients to get a good deal on ordering three vials. And we say for obviously in uh, intrauterine insemination, you can either do a wash or an unwashed, we'll wash the specimen here, but it's usually washed. And then for imbecile, unwashed, and then of course, ART, if they're gonna go on to IVF. Gotcha. Um, another good question from Jennifer. Uh, she's asking what differentiates who is eligible for um, InvoCell versus IVF? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's, it, it's kind of, it, it changes. Um, I know our criteria changed a little bit or we bent the criteria when we were having such great success with it. We started to kind of go uh, outreach to older women, maybe women who did not have as good of an ovarian response. So in most cases, women who will be candidates for donor insemination are going to be candidates for doing imbecile, but it's usually women under the age of 38 who, um, if they are uh, single or gay women, um, you know, a good, a good ovarian reserve. Um, and I mean, the easiest answer though, is if they're usually candidates for donor insemination, they're candidates for imbecile. Okay. Um, Okay, another question that we got is how far in advance of starting treatment should I pick a donor and order vials? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, I would say about a month, two month process. So if somebody calls me on the phone, we go through, you know, the whole, th all the discussion that we've had today. And then I put them in touch with our andrology lab and we order through, in our case, LabCorp. We do the screening on the donors and then they do the purchasing. So we usually ask them, hey, wait to get back the CMV status, then order the sperm. We'll have the sperm shipped here and then we're ready to go. So it can be a very quick process. Uh, three In three months, we can be doing the insemination. Courtney, that brings up another question I had for you. And you'll know more about this than I because we don't see these patients and some of them don't maybe admit to us that they've done it. How often do women purchase sperm to do insemination at home? Um, it happens pretty frequently. Um, so we do ship uh, directly to a residential address if the patient is working with a clinic or a primary care provider. So we do require an extra form for that. Um, but sometimes, you know, patients do want to start there if they're young and healthy and, um, 
want to give it a go uh, in a little bit more natural setting, um, we can certainly help with that. We, we do always toss it back that you want to be working with um, someone who can give you good guidance. Um, obviously, ovulation prediction kits and those kind of things are, are very helpful as well. But even doing some pre-screening um, to make sure that there aren't things that you're unaware of that could be hindering you getting pregnant. And then you've you know, invested money into three or four months of donor sperm when you know, perhaps it was never going to work for you doing it that way. So um, we, but, but we will ship um, to a residence. I, you know, I think you and I have looked at a couple of studies together and, and certainly the pregnancy rates are, um, are much higher going straight to IUI in a clinical setting. Um, but people do get pregnant um, doing home insemination as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I wanted to go back and to, to answer a little bit on the question before about how far in advance to order donor sperm. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that we do offer pretty aggressive um, free storage if you purchase multiple vials with us. So let's just say, you know, 2021 is your year. You know you want to have a um, start trying at some point this year, but you're not quite ready or you're waiting to, um, to have your consultation with Dr. Meyer and his team, it's okay on our end to go ahead and start looking. You know, the, the um, market is very competitive right now and we are constantly, um, you know, getting donors in and out of inventory just based on the demand. Um, and so we can help you really, you know, get a... Uh, get an idea about the type of donor you're looking for. You can go ahead and purchase. And then if you're um, getting your waiting on your test to come back from Dr. Meyer, where there's genetic testing or CMV or what have you, um, and it's something that uh, you end up purchasing a donor that's not compatible with you, medically speaking, we can issue what is called a medical swap and swap your donor for free, no additional files uh, for doing that. If it's uh, you know a note from your doctor saying that this donor is no longer um, available and competitive. So I would encourage you to start the process, um, you know, at least of looking early as you can and go ahead and get some of those vials in storage so that when um, your physician gives you the go ahead and you're ready to roll, that those, those vials are ready to be shipped. So I wanted to add that in. Um, okay, let's see. We already talked about um, the typical process, uh, typical cost of the entire process. Uh, this person said that their partner and her both wanted to carry the child. Um, and you sort of answered that already. I don't know if you have anything else to, to say there. Yeah, I don't know if they were hinting at reciprocal IVF, where we collect eggs on uh, one of the female partners and uh, obviously do insemination in the lab. And then the other partner carries the pregnancy. And that can be done in a fresh cycle. It can be done using standard IVF or it can be done doing Invisil. So yeah, reciprocal IVF is um, obviously a great way to um, kind of share in the, in the uh, process of having a child for two women. Wonderful. Um, and I, I think I mentioned earlier that we do free um, file transfers between partners. So if the partner, one partner carries on the first one and the accounts under her name will easily transfer those vials to your partner's name for free. So you can just give us a call and we can help you um, help you do that. That's a pretty common request that we get. Um, Dr. Meyer, I'd like to ask you, you know, when um, you see patients, how often do they come into your office with a sperm bank already in mind versus they're really just starting the process from scratch? Okay, that, that's a great question. It, mm -hmm. It's funny because yesterday, or it's ironic, yesterday we had a known donor come in. So it was uh, two women who had decided to use a friend of theirs um, uh, to be the sperm donor. And um, he asked me, I mean, he was great. He was talking and it was obvious to him that we didn't do a lot of known donors because we, you know, going through all the steps, some things flow very well in the clinic that had some hiccups along the way. And he just kind of laughed and said, do you do many known donors? And we said, no, we don't. He said, and why is that? He said, well, number one, um, you know, there, there can be potential repercussions on using somebody that you know, but the real reason is it gets more costly because 
we, we bring in a, a legal counsel. They want to go through a contract. Um, like the gentleman said yesterday, he said, I never thought about it, but if I'm a known donor and something happens to the, the women who carry the pregnancy, if they were in a car wreck, then um, I now have a contract that gets me kind of out of having to do child rearing where I, I didn't, didn't expect to have to do that. So we don't do a lot of known donor um, uh, inseminations. The other thing is, you know, it used to, you used to have to quarantine sperm. We don't have to do that anymore. So um, when patients come to us, I'd say at least 50% have gone on and already looked at the banks. Um, a lot of them have gone on to our website and uh, they have seen, you know, the one thing is they've seen the arrangement we have with you. Um, they've talked to somebody else at another bank. They found the donor that they want to use. Um, most are not so aware of the CMB problem, but like you said, we're 80 to 90% of people are CMB positive. It really usually comes down to not being uh, an issue. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'd say at least half of the people have gone in and looked at the bank. And I'd say probably about 10 to 20% of patients will make an inquire, come to us, talk to us, and then decide to postpone things. Um, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Probably curiosity. They just want to find out a little bit more. The other reason may be is the expense, not only on, the, on your side, but also our side. I mean, going through the process, it, it, it is costly. Um, but um, you know, most of the stuff in reproductive uh, endocrine and infertility, unfortunately, it does get expensive. Definitely, it sure does, and it's great to see um, you know more and more insurances having at least some sort of coverage. Uh, a lot of it's state state you know regulated, of course, but um, it's good to see that. And then we also work with a company called Future Family, who can help um, provide some financial assistance um, programs to be able to to help you finance some of this stuff. So if you're working with us and using donor sperm, be sure to ask us about Future Family. Our team can kind of talk you through how that would work. They're a fantastic company who we've had a, a lot of luck with, um, with our patients. So. Hey, let me ask you a question on exclusion criteria. Like when we screen our egg donors in our program, um, your donors, they don't go through any uh, psychological counseling, do they? Donor counselor um, to talk about the implications of being not only a sperm donor, but also an open ID donor. Okay. Which, uh, you know, again, you're coming into our program knowing that you're going to be an open ID donor. And that's certainly a lot to think about for these guys. We also talked to them about things like 23andMe. Uh, this is a technology that wasn't around 20 years ago. And uh, people didn't have to consider that as part of the equation. So, uh, yeah, we talk all of our donors through that. And there are there are some guys that get to that point in the process and, um, you know, decide that this is really not the program for them. They hadn't considered some of those things. And that's, I think that's a wonderful thing. You know, we want people to be in it for the right reason. We have fantastic donors. Um, these guys are so mature. We've been interviewing them recently, uh, talking about their experience in the programs. Other guys uh, getting into the program can kind of hear what it's like. Um, and they're just so wonderful and mature and, you know, understand exactly what they're doing and who they're helping, which is, which is fantastic. We want everybody to feel comfortable on both ends of the spectrum, right? Gotcha. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that's all the questions that we had um, in the Facebook, unless someone else wants to, to throw them in. There were some really good ones there. We've got, uh, we're about 10 minutes to the hour, Dr. Meyer. I'm sure you have patients this afternoon. Okay, yeah, I do. Uh, Courtney, thanks a lot for uh, putting on this seminar and this presentation. I think it'll be helpful. Hopefully you get a recording on it and women can and can tap into this. Couples can tap into this and look at it. We'll try to get it up on our, uh, on our webpage and maybe um, we can work together on that. And again, Absolutely. thanks for doing everything you all do for our patients. It's terrific with the relationship we have and our patients are always complimentary of uh, Seattle Sperm Bank. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the conversation today. This was a fun lunch break. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.